1916, the USS North Carolina has a huge drawback as an aircraft carrier. She has nowhere for her planes to land. She must use planes that can land on water, but these must be winched back on board every time they fly. Hardly practical for a ship of war. Landing planes on the ship itself requires a long deck and a ship big enough to accommodate it. The 28,000 ton HMS Ark Royal. In August 1917, Royal Navy pilot Edwin Dunning attempts the first landing on a moving ship. The obstacles he must negotiate include the ship's central bridge and funnel, known as the superstructure. In a truly audacious move, Commander Dunning swoops sideways in front of them and lands on the front deck. Five days later, he tries again. But as he touches down, the engine stalls and he loses control of the plane. The deck crew try to grab the powerless aircraft, but strong winds blow it over the side. Dunning is knocked unconscious and drowns in his cockpit. Commander Edwin Dunning proves that a deck landing is possible, but he pays the ultimate price. Making the deck safe for landing requires redesigning the ship's superstructure, the obstacle that had blighted Dunning's approach. One proposed solution was to split the superstructure into two parts, moving them either side of the flight deck but the gap between the two blocks is hardly wide enough to allow a plane to land, and naval architects fear this will unnerve their pilots. They consider removing one of the blocks. Not such a good idea. So naval architects search for a way to offset the weight of the block they now call the island to correct the ship's balance. They fill the port fuel tanks to the brim whilst only partially filling the tanks on the starboard side. But as she begins to run out of fuel, the ship starts to list again. Then they try moving the entire hangar to port, leaving behind an empty space. But the crew soon fills the void with equipment and the ship regains its starboard list. Finally, they decide to physically extend the hull outward on the port side and shift the heavy machinery to balance the boat. After two decades of trial and error, they now have a truly revolutionary design. HMS Ark Royal is launched in 1937. The Ark Royal is the mother of all modern carriers. Her island sits on her starboard side, allowing a long, clear flight deck. Her layout sets the template for every carrier to come, including the Nimitz. Like the Ark Royal, the Nimitz is a giant floating airport. The island is her control tower, her eyes, ears, and brain. Within her nerve center on the first floor are the officers in charge of the flight deck. Above them are the radar and weather rooms. Above these on the fifth floor is the captain's bridge he runs the ship from here in overall command of strategy and tactics. But on the top of the island, nestling just below the radar domes, sits perhaps the most important place on any carrier, primary flight control. Here, the air boss and mini boss run the business end of this warship, 
controlling the operation of her strike fighters. Ilark Slans, mend and ready, sir. List is 0.6, starboard down. Okay, thanks, appreciate it. They control the busy airspace around the Nimitz, takeoffs and landings. But this is no ordinary runway. The flight deck has been called the most dangerous workplace on Earth. Here, the deck crew must dodge wings, blades, and jets as they fuel, arm, and park the multi-million dollar warplanes. Turning starboard, heel to port. Watch your moves, watch your step. Engineers mirror the layout of the flight deck in miniature to keep track of the comings and goings of each aircraft. We'll take him back to L4 and we'll stuff the hole right there. It's literally nuts and bolts technology. This is the Ouija board. This is a miniature version of the flight deck and these little plastic pieces that we have here keep track of aircraft that we actually have out on deck. Now these nuts um, and bolts, they represent different things. This means that it needs an aircraft uh, that needs to be turned, its engines turned, and then this one uh, means it needs fuel. It helps us keep track of everything going out on the flight deck since it moves at such a fast pace out there. They're constantly updating this board. Got to get him out. I got to clean up L4. I've got to drop this guy down off into the hangar. And if you want, you can put 203 on the elevator. It really doesn't matter to me. This is always reliable. If we have a power outage, I can always rely on this being up and running. Hey, before you put something in L1, make sure it's got missiles uh, on it, right? The Nimitz can operate more aircraft than any other carrier in the world. Up to 90 lethal warplanes. But in 1938, HMS Ark Royal, the biggest British carrier, can only handle about 50 aircraft. But the American admirals of the time want double that number for their carriers. But there isn't enough room in their hangars to store them. So the deck must take the overspill. This is potentially disastrous if an aircraft coming into land doesn't stop at once. It takes years to resolve the problem. The solution will be built into the new 34,000 ton USS Hornet. From the time of the first carriers, engineers have been experimenting with ways of slowing planes down by snaring them with so-called arrestor wires. Well, the earliest systems consisted simply of ropes attached to pairs of sandbags. And the aircraft would come down and engage this rope, but of course, one set of sandbags was not enough to stop a heavy aircraft. So as the aircraft proceeded down the flight deck, it had to engage successive pairs of sandbags until there was enough resistance to stop the airplane. This simple system, of course, was nowhere adequate for high-performance aircraft, so other more complex systems had to be developed. On the USS Hornet, they must stop an 8,000-kilogram warplane landing at over 135 kilometers an hour in just 45 meters. This is how they do it. As a plane comes into land, a hook on its tail snares an arrestor wire and pulls it forward. Beneath the deck, this action forces a ram into a cylinder filled with fluid. This fluid dampens the plane's momentum as it is squeezed up a tube and through an opening, made ever smaller by a closing plunger. An elegant solution But in practice, snagging a single wire proves difficult for the pilots to do. So the engineers line up several wires, one behind the other, to increase the chances of a successful grab. But even this doesn't guarantee success. During the Second World War, it was fair to characterize the landings as looking like a controlled crash. 
as the pilot approaches the back of the ship, um, he's going to fly his airplane into position just above the wires, and then he hopes that the airplane will drop right into the middle of those wires and pick up one of those 12 wires. If they didn't catch any of the wires, then they had five what they called Davis barriers uh, that would engage the landing gear on the aircraft and stop it that way. Unfortunately, these Davis barriers normally would flip the airplane upside down, but it would definitely stop. Today on the Nimitz, trapping an arrestor wire has become even more challenging. Jets hit the deck traveling at 225 kilometers an hour, giving a pilot precious little time to guide his plane onto the wire. It's so difficult that pilots must practice over a hundred simulated landings before they're allowed to try the real thing. Now landing on a carrier is a lot different than landing at a long airfield with 12,000 or even a 5,000 foot strip. This is what we call the dirty configuration. I've got my gear down, my flaps are full, and my hook's down ready to catch the wire. And there's no mistaking it. When you catch wire, it's a lot like a mild car crash. It throws you forward in the straps, and you definitely know that airplane's going to stop. The principle behind the arrestor system hasn't changed in over 60 years. But the Nimitz pushes the system's braking power to the limit. It must bring a 25,000 kilogram F-18 traveling at 225 kilometers an hour to a stop in just over 100 meters. About the length of a football pitch. But even with four wires to target, the pilots sometimes miss altogether and must go round again. They call this doing a bolter. A bolter is when you've got your hook down with an intention to land and the jet doesn't stop. You may have a couple of choice words as you're going back flying again, and uh, you can probably picture all your buddies down here watching the pass and, uh, and horse laughing you. You fail miserably <laughs> and then you get heckled by all your friends for the rest of the day. To give a bolting pilot the chance of a clean getaway, the landing deck on the Nimitz angles out to sea, away from the parked aircraft. To help perfect their skills, senior pilots stand at the stern, passing judgment on each landing. We will grade them on their start, the in the middle position, at the in close position, and then again as they cross the ramp. And then the grade goes into an overall grade point average uh, for how everybody's doing. Every pilot and every squadron thinks they're the best. Uh, definitely mean, me. Yeah, it's this guy. <laughs> He's the worst pilot. That guy. <laughs>